In the Magic the Gathering universe, Dominaria is the place where most of the lore has occurred throughout various sets of the game. With over 25 years of storytelling, numerous events have occurred on this plane for both good and ill. Fantastic lore from novels old and new, comic books, short stories, and even flavor text, the lore is absolutely massive in scope. For some newer players or others wanting to get more involved with the story, it could be a challenge to dissect and figure out everything that has happened over the many years. In this series, the overall goal is to break down as much of this content as possible while also attempting to make it easier for viewers both old and new to understand everything that has happened. With that being said, let us begin. Here is A History of Dominaria. Dominaria is roughly two and a half times larger than our planet Earth, with large shallow seas occupying most of the surface. For quick reference, here is a laid out map of the plane, and here is a map of Earth in relation to Dominaria. Earth is much smaller when comparing the two planets. Dominaria is very similar to Earth in many ways, however, as it has one natural moon, a day that consists of 24 hours, and the same gravity level as our planet, despite Dominaria being much more massive, as planets tend to have more gravitational pull if they are larger. One possible explanation for this is that Dominaria is a hollow planet, or at the very least has hollow layers somewhere between the surface and the core, unlike Earth, where it is theorized that we have a top layer called the crust, a mantle layer, with an outer and inner core underneath. Dominaria also has a year that consists of 420 days divided into 12 35-day months, compared to Earth's 365.25 days that are broken down into 12 months, with days ranging from 28 to 31. This means either Dominaria travels a longer distance around its sun, or it's traveling slower overall to get a full revolution. On the actual plane itself, Dominaria contains many different land masses. For instance, there is the eastern continent of Tarisir, the western continent of Arona, followed by the central continent of Jamura, Otaria which lies between Jamura and Tarisir, Sarpedi in the southeast, along with the Arctic Northland and the frozen reaches in the south. There are also other places of importance on Dominaria that we will go over in the series, such as Kalimon, Karandor, Madara, Shiv, and even Teleria. But going over the specifics of these areas will be done after this video. Instead, we first need to look at what has happened on Dominaria. We will do this from a timeline perspective and while you might not know some of the areas that will be mentioned right away, as the specifics for those will be for later videos, we will reference the map as much as possible. Now onto the timeline. First we must begin with the dating system. The most widely used is the Argivian Reckoning System, or AR for short. It works similar to our BCE and CE, or BC and AD in our society. The AR system revolves around the birth of Urza and Mishra, who was born in the year zero. Any events that happen before this event will start with a negative sign, followed by the year, while any events after the birth of Urza and Mishra will just have the year. Around the year negative 20,000 AR, one of the first events happened on Dominaria. The mighty Ur Dragon spawns the first dragons on the plane, the Elder Dragons. The Ur Dragon is also the progenitor of all other dragons, not just for Dominaria, but for all dragons in the multiverse, which makes it one of the most powerful entities in the lore. The first dragons that spawned from this mighty avatar were Arcata Sabbath, Palladia Mors, Chromia Rule, Vivictus Asmani, Piru, and most notably Nicol Bolas and Ugin. There was an eighth elder dragon, Marivia Sal, but this elder dragon was killed off by humanoid hunters soon after her birth. Between that and the year negative 17,000 AR, the Elder Dragon War took place. This was a massive war that took place on the plane that included humans and sorcerers, along with many different dragon clans as well. At the beginning of the war, the descendants of Vivictus Asmati invaded Nicol Bolas' territory, causing a great defeat to Bolas, but soon after, Nicol Bolas would be able to turn the tides in his favor by influencing other dragon clans to his side. Near the end of the war, Nicol Bolas ruled about half of Dominaria, with the last of the fighting occurring on the continent of Jamura. This was a battle between Bolas' army and the forces of Arcata Sabbath, which would end with Ugin interfering to prevent Arcadus' downfall. Soon afterwards, out of spite for Ugin, Nicol Bolas had his spark ignited and planeswalked away. Ugin also had his planeswalker spark ignited, but for different reasons. While all the Elder Dragons did survive the war, all other dragons on the losing sides would be stripped of their dragon status and would be grounded for all eternity. These creatures would become the worms of Dominaria. Around this time as well, the War of the Abyss took place. While not much is really known about this event overall, it is known that the Demon Lord Belzenlock from the 2018 set Dominaria would be trapped inside the Void, which is the area in between planes. After the Elder Dragon War between negative 17,000 and negative 16,000 AR, the second generation of Elder Dragons, the Prime Evils, ruled the plane of Dominaria for quite some time. These dragons consisted of Darigaz the Igniter, Rith the Awakener, Trevor the Renewer, Dromar the Banisher, and Croesus the Purger, who have depictions in the invasion set. While they were some of the most powerful dragons at this time, they were eventually defeated by a group of powerful wizards called the Numena, 
who would imprison and steal the primeval's powers and would rule over Dominaire for the next 1,000 years. Around negative 15,000 AR, the first planeswalker battle of Dominaria would take place on the land of Madara between Nicol Bolas and the demonic leviathan creature. While is not too sure of exactly when Nicol Bolas came back to Dominaria, we know previously him and Ugin had many confrontations on the meditation plane and other areas before Nicol Bolas killed his twin brother for the first time. The battle with the leviathan lasted about one month and in the process destroyed most of Madara along with creating the first temporal rift. Nicol Bolas would then feast on the leviathan for a year, trying to absorb the creature's powers and what remained of the Leviathan creature would become the area known as the Talon Gates. Between negative 15,000 and negative 5,000 AR, we have our first major gap of time that is present within the lore of magic. However, we can assume that 1. Most civilizations of Dominaria are stabilized in a way, and 2. The Thran Empire starts to become an advanced technological powerhouse in the area of Tarisir. The Thran Empire was the most powerful civilization on Tarisir at the time, and lots of their records were lost when they were destroyed. However, what we know about the Thran Empire occurs sometime between negative 5000 AR and about negative 4800 AR. The Thran Empire is basically the MTG version of other super advanced races that we know of, such as the Atlanteans in our own mythos. The Thran Empire was also spread out into 8 different city-states along the continent, along with having multiple colonies elsewhere on Dominaria. The Thran's technology ran on power stones, which was basically their form of electricity, along with having industrialized factories and machines, chairs that were able to fly for transportation, and other inventions that made them far superior than other civilizations on the plane at that time. Closer toward the end of negative 4800 AR, the Thran Empire would go through a major civil war which would cause their downfall quickly afterwards. This was more or less caused by one of the most famous characters in magic's history, Yamoth, who rose to power years prior after being summoned out of exile. He was brought back to solve a problem of a disease called Thysis throughout Halcyon, capital of the Thran Empire, but throughout the years before the Thran's downfall, he met a planeswalker that would help him discover and restructure the plane of Phyrexia, which was a plane that had nine vastly different layers and was based on hell from the Divine Comedy. This would lead to Yalmoth gathering disease-ridden citizens to the plane, which would then lead to the creation of the first Phyrexians. Yalmoth would then take over the government of the Thran Empire, causing some of the other city-states to declare war on him, and eventually destroy the city of Halcyon via weapons of mass destruction. While Yalmoth was not a casualty himself, he would become trapped on the plane of Phyrexia for some time via the character Rebek from the novel The Thran. If you want to know more about the Thran Empire and the story of Yamoth, you can check out the Thran unofficial audiobook that I did prior to this video by checking out the rest of my channel. Moving on to the land of Karandor, roughly right after the fall of the Thran Empire, we see the events of the Skarzam dragons taking place. Karandor was being taken over by a woman named Savitri Skarzam and her horde of dragon creatures who came to the continent through unknown means. While the inhabitants of Karandor try to unite and fight back, they weren't successful until a special contact poison was created to combat the dragons. Soon afterwards, nearly all of the dragons were destroyed, which forced Savitri Skarzam to leave the plane altogether. While these events were going on, the Jamuran Kingdom of Zalfur was rising to power on that continent. More on that later. Between negative 2400 AR and negative 400 AR, multiple stories would take place on Karandor still. The first was the Dacon Blackblade and Gaiadrone Diada storyline, which was depicted in the Dacon Blackblade comic books back in the late 90s by Armada Comics. What happens in this time period is that a warrior named Dacon forges the now famous Black Blade for another creature, Gaiadron Diada, in exchange for triggering his planeswalker spark. Diada then conquers Karandor, creates Sol Kanar the Swamp King by twisting a local spirit of nature, while also magically bounding Dacon to a boy from the recently destroyed town of Karth, basically losing his ability to planeswalk. This would later lead to Dacon fighting not just Diada, but also fighting the Elder Dragon Chromium Rule and killing the Elder Dragon Piru. Diada would then absorb Piru's power and magically marking Dacon permanently. Diada would planeswalk away and would not return to the land for thousands of years. Meanwhile, Dacon and the young boy, who he was magically bound to, would travel to the land of Tarisir, where the young boy would live and eventually start the Karthalion lineage. The other story that happens on Karandor is the story of Zaro and Sol Kanar. Zaro was an archmage who used the Horn Halo to turn the Sarah Angel Trine in order to conquer the northern portion of Karandor which he accomplished and ruled for about 300 years. However, his adopted son Eskil gets another Sarah Angel to subdue the Angel Trine. In the process, Eskil gets splashed with Trine's blood and becomes blind, but gets his planeswalker spark ignited becoming Eskil the White. Eskil the White would later mentor the famous Jermuran Mangaran many years later. So Kanar, on the other hand, wanted to conquer North Karandor also by summoning the Skarzam dragons mentioned previously. He did overall succeed in summoning the dragons, but Savichi Skarzam also comes back and turns on Sol Kanar. This would lead to one of the major towns of Karandor, Kone, being destroyed in the process. After that, nothing else is expanded upon when coming to this part of the timeline. Now onto one of the most beloved tales in all of Magic the Gathering, 
the Brothers' War. As it was mentioned earlier in this video, Urza and Mishra were born in the year zero, with Urza being born on the first day of the year and Mishra being born on the last day of the year. While growing up on the continent of Tarisir, Urza and Mishra's father had them apprenticed to a family friend and archaeologist, Tokasia, when the brothers were only 10 years old. However, their father would soon die two years later. A few years after that, the brothers and Tokasia would discover the Ornithopter device, which was an ancient Thran flying device used by the civilization. The Thran Empire at this point in time had been gone for almost 5,000 years. In the year 20 AR, the trio discovered the Caves of Koilos, which was the area that was beneath the once famous Thran capital of Halcyon. There, they discovered the Power Stones from the Thran storyline that kept the Phyrexian portal closed, with both brothers fighting over the Power Stone and accidentally splitting it in half. The two halves of the Power Stone were depicted as the Might Stone and the Meek Stone, illustrating the magic set's Alpha and Beta. Out of rage and frustration, the brothers began shooting energy out of their halves of the Power Stone, which caused the brothers to mistakenly kill their mentor, Tokasia. With this sudden realization, Mishra flees the cave and would get captured by a wandering desert tribe called the Falaji, while Urza retreated to the city of Krug, where he would later become a famous artificer. From 21 AR to 27 AR, Urza would marry the Princess of Yodia, which was a coastal kingdom in Tarisir, while Mishra became the head wizard of the Falaji. Both brothers would then apprentice young artificers, with Urza training Tanos and Mishra training Ashad, along with Mishra recruiting a dragon engine, which was a mechanical dragon from the plane of Phyrexia. Also in this time period, you would have an attempt at a peace conference trying to be established. With the peace negotiations failing overall, Urza becoming leader of Yodia after the previous leader is killed off, Mishra becoming the new leader of the Falaji, a second peace conference that also became a disaster and officially started the Brothers' War, with Mishra lastly attacking the city of Krug with his dragon engines. On top of that, the character Gix, one of Yalma's battle commanders during the Thran Civil War, enters the plane of Dominaria through the caves of Koilos. From there on in the year 28 AR, until the war's conclusion, you have a group called the Third Way being established on Tarisir that sought out neutrality during the Brothers' War. Just a year later, Feldon, who was the leader of this newly found group, would discover the Golgothian Silex, which would be an important artifact for the end of the war and very much equatable to a weapon of mass destruction. After this, many battles would take place on the continent, the priests of the Brotherhood of Gix would infiltrate the Third Way, and in the year 57 AR, Gix would lure both Urza and Mishra's forces to the island of Argoth, where they would strip the land of its resources. By 64 AR, the last battle of the Brothers' War begins. Gix would make both armies on the island go berserk and cause mass chaos in the ranks, the Golgothian Silex is given a Thanos by Ashan before being killed off by Gix, and it is revealed that Mishra has been altered by Phyrexian constructs. However, it is not revealed if Mishra went to Phyrexia and was slain to be replaced with an imposter, or if Mishra became a Phyrexian on his own will. Shortly after, Urza activates the Golgothian Silex, which destroys the entire island of Argoth, transforms the land of Urborg into a swampland, and slowly sent the rest of Dominaria into an Ice Age. Urza then ascends to become a Planeswalker, his eyes are infused with the Might Stone and the Meek Stone, and he Planeswalks away. Along with that, Gix and his minions retreat back into Phyrexia through the Caves of Koilos, and the Shard of the Twelve Worlds begins to form, which starts to slowly seal Dominaria and a few other planes from the rest of the multiverse. The activation of the Silex Blast officially ends the Brothers' War. Jumping ahead to the year 170 AR, we end up on the continent of Sarpedia, where the events of the magic set Fallen Empires takes place. Sarpedia's inhabitants include five groups, one for each color of the magic wheel. These include the Order of the Ebon Hand represented by black, the Merfolk of Vidalia represented by blue, the Sarpedian Elves represented by green, the Sarpedian Dwarves of the color red, and the Icadian Humans of the color white. Because of the Silex Blast that Urza initiated over 100 years earlier on Argoth, and the major aftermath that affected Dominaria's climate, the Sarpedian Empires were getting affected by major weather changes. First off, the Vidalian Merfolks were conquered by the Antarctic race known as the Homerids. This was due to the waters between Sarpedia and the frozen reaches becoming much cooler and the Homerids gaining more territory since there are now more places suited to their needs. Due to the harsh winters, former Icadian soldier and Ebon Hand member Riyad Day would influence the goblins and orc of the Crimson Mountains to overthrow the Dwarven Empire. However, Riyad Day's magic would inadvertently cause the Thalids to become sentient creatures, which led to the Sarpedian elves to be killed off by the Thalids. The Order of the Ebon Hand, meanwhile, were using creatures called Thralls to be bred for making armor, slaves, and tools of war but Rhea Day would step in and influence the creatures to rebel against them. This would lead to the Ebon Hand being overthrown entirely, and the Thralls slowly taken over the rest of Sarpedia. Icadia would be the last group to be overtaken, as they were taken up with the same orcs and goblins that took out the dwarves. This particular force was led by Tevish Sot, also known as Tev Lunglade, after his sister was assassinated by former Icadian Oliver Farrow of the Farrow-like cult. Tevish Sot would become important later on, as he was a planeswalker at this time. In the year 430 AR, we start seeing the events of the novel The Gathering Dark. This story introduces us to the character Joda, who is about 17 years old at this point in time, and has a direct blood relation to Urza and Mishra. 
In this particular year, Joda is apprenticed to a wandering red mage named Voska who would give him a magical mirror but would become captured by the Church of Tao, a religion that believed magic was evil. While Joda would later escape and try to be reunited with his mentor, he would accidentally find the Fountain of Youth, discover that Voska was executed, and would later accompany another mage, Sima, to the City of Shadows. Joda would later find himself in the company of Marisol and would join the Conclave of Mages. Marisol would try to use Joda to open a plane to Phyrexia after it was discovered that Joda's ancestor, Jarsol, found a way onto the plane itself through previous diary entries. However, the Church of Tao would then assault the Conclave of Mages, which then Joda would free the former Conclave of Mages leader, Lord Ith, from imprisonment. Lord Ith would then kill Marisol, Joda would use Vasca's mirror to help cure Lord Ith's insanity due to the long-term imprisonment, and the other mages of the Conclave would defeat the forces of the Tao Church. With the Conclave lying in ruin, Sima, Joda, and the rest of the surviving mages traveled to the City of Shadows. Sima would die a few years later, causing Joda to go insane, but he too would use Voska's mirror to help wipe his mind clean, which he would repeat every 100 years. Between this and 600 AR, the Ravian planeswalker Taser would make his way to Dominaria and fall in love with future Dominarian Titan Christine of the Woods. By the time 600 AR comes to pass, the Shard of the Twelve Worlds that was first caused by the Silex Blast is fully formed. This would make it to where planeswalkers from one of the Twelve Worlds to be essentially trapped within the Shard. After this, there's about a 1200 year gap in the Dominarian timeline where the next event we run into is around the year 1800 AR. In this period, Urza, who made it his lifelong goal to kill the Phyrexians, meets the defected Phyrexian new Xantia. They plan and invade the plane of Phyrexia, but during the attack, Urza gets captured and Yalmoth begins to turn him mad. After this, we are left with another large gap in time that spans over 600 years, with the next event coming around 2434 AR. At this time, Tevisot, who was part of the plan that took out the Sarpedian Kingdom of Acadia, helps with felling another kingdom called Storgar. Storgar was also the hometown of Freilis, where she would duel Jason Carthline and was fatally stabbed by him, but in doing so, caused her planeswalker spark to ignite. The duel was very much forced though, as Freilis and Jason Carthline were childhood friends and only fought due to the leader at the time being controlled by Tebis Sot. After the duel, Jason Carthline and another character, Oriol Yeldos, head south with the remaining Storgar refugees and founded Yeldor. Alongside that, the massive creature Merit Lage was imprisoned in the massive Ronum Glacier, which was also located at Storgard. In the year 2500 AR, Urza and Xanta escape Yalmoth's imprisonment and flee to Sarah's realm. While in Sarah's realm, Urza's mind is mostly healed, but the Phyrexians would eventually follow the two and invade the plane itself. This prompts Sarah to leave her plane, but causes the Radiant Angel to rise to power soon afterwards. A century after this, on the land of Jamura in 2600 AR, the first Ojanin rebels against his creator, Terran Amis. Ojana's creator was essentially a humanoid being who created the first Jamur and Tiger Warriors by infusing the essence of both Tiger and Man. Terran Amis also created Ojana first and anointed him as the leader of the Tiger Warrior clans, which influenced him to build the Tabernacle of Pentor Vale. However, Ojana would soon find out that his race was only created for nothing more than slave labor and would rally to fight for their freedom from their creator. Ojana would fight off the Ur Drago while the rest of his people fled to a place called the Sakurvian Desert. Around 2655 AR, on the continent of Verona, the warrior nation of Keld is founded by Craddock. Craddock and the original Keldans evacuated from the land of Parma, just to the east of Keld, in order to escape the extremely cold temperatures. The mountains of the new place they arrived at called to Craddock to where he would trek up to the top and forge a bond with the land itself. This would cause Craddock to be able to use fire magic and help his people establish the new nation. In 2834 AR, Elder Dragon Arcata Sabbath is summoned by the powerful wizard Lesrak to duel Christine of the Woods. She would go on to duel and kill off Arcata Sabbath during their fighting. Lestrak will become more involved with the story later on, as this is one of the first things that we know he does. Also around the same year, another powerful wizard, Baron, would learn a spell called the Blair of Doom at the ripe age of 19. Baron was a powerful mage with the goal of becoming the best wizard overall, but would become more important when we get back to the Urza story further down the timeline. In 2934 AR, you had the Summit of the Null Moon that took place. The Summit of the Null Moon was a gathering of planeswalkers in order to puncture the Shard of the Twelve Worlds. The summit also took place on the massive Thran artificial satellite that was once used during the Thran Civil War thousands of years before. Characters that were present for the summit were Freilis, Christine of the Woods, Taser, Ravidel, and the Elder Dragon Chromium Rule, along with Ferelin, Lesrak, and Tevisot. However, the latter three characters had hatched a plan to see if they could kill one of the other planeswalkers and use their energy to pierce the shard and escape to the plane of Chandelar. While none of the planeswalkers died in the fighting, Chromium Rule and Ravidel were both killed off in the fighting. Shortly after, though, Christine in the Woods and Taser would help resurrect Ravidel, which also ignited his Planeswalker Spark. Furious that his close friend Chromium was not resurrected instead of him, along with his master Farallon betraying him shortly before, Ravidel was driven mad and would later secretly devise a long-term plot of revenge. 
Freilies would then later on enlist Jael Carthline to go on a quest to find Tevishat and defeat him. Jael Carthline was an unsuccessful knight of Yeldor that lost the prestige of his lineage, but would go on to find an artifact called the Amulet of Quaz, which helped him find and banish Tevishat from Dominaria. In the same year, Joda and Jaya Balor rescued Yeldor and King Darien from an attack on his life by the Knights of Stromgold, which would help Joda unite the forces of Yeldor and the nation of Balduvi in order to fight against Limduel. Jaya Balor comes into the picture earlier when she tries to pickpocket Joda in her younger years. Sensing magical potential, Joda brings her to the School of the Unseen to learn about magic, but she learns only a few magic spells before leaving the school to become a task mage. She would later track down Joda after his disappearance, which the wizard Limduel was behind all along. Limdul was a former Yeld soldier who, after a failed mission in his early military years, discovered the ruins of the Conclave of Mages and found the Ring of Marisol the Pretender. Wearing the ring gave him immense magical power and making him a great necromancer, but he was also infected by the essence of Marisol when he put the ring on. The Planeswalker Leshrac would also come into his life and grant him powerful magical abilities to summon a massive army of the undead. In the battle between the united human forces and the undead, Joda and Limdul, who was fully under the control of Marisol, fought against each other. However, Leshrac would interfere by cutting off Limduel's hand to sever his connection with Marisol, Leshrac taking Limduel back to Phyrexia and Chandelar, and the united human army winning the battle against Limduel's undead forces. After the battle, Joda would call on the planeswalker Freilis using an artifact that Jaya Ballard had from her previous adventures. Freilis would then borrow Joda's magic mirror to conduct the world spell to destroy the shard, ending the Dominarian Ice Age, and starting the Flood Ages. Jael Carthline, with the help of Freilis, would go on to marry the elven elder druid Kesa a decade later thus continuing the Carthaline lineage. Between 2934 and 2953 AR, Christina in the Woods would leave Taser of Arabia. Ravidel, who was taken on by Taser after the summit of the Null Moon, influences Taser to hunt down planeswalkers in an effort to get back to his home of Arabia, which was blocked by a magical spell from Taser's main nemesis thousands of years prior. This would be very similar to how Farrowin wanted to kill off one of the planeswalkers during the summit of the Null Moon to pierce the shard and gain access to Chandelar. Taser would eventually hunt down Leshrac, but since he can't bring himself to kill him, he instead imprisons him on Phyrexia. Rabidel would soon leave Taser's side for some time afterwards. Along with that on Tarisir, flowing from Freilis' world spell causes War to slowly engulf the land of Finhorn. Jael Carthaline and Kesa would then lead the Finhorn refugees to Yavimaya and try to make peace with the intelligent Yavimaya guerrillas. On top of that, the Khan of Tarisir, due to the massive flooding, is split into six distinct isles. By the year 2954 AR, Joda would permanently unite Yeldor and Baldivit into new Argive, while Marisol, still inside the ring once possessed by Limdul, takes control of Jai Ballard, who at this time possessed the ring. She cuts Joda's throat, using his blood to revive Phyrexian war beasts, which she then proceeds to destroy the area of Soldev and the School of the Unseen. Joda miraculously saves himself from certain death with the help of his magic mirror, and then bows the possessed Jai Ballard in the debris of the ruined Soldev. He managed to shatter his mirror directly into her face, triggering the magic from when Freilis enchanted the mirror during the world spell. In the blazing inferno that followed this breakpoint, Jaya Ballard had her Planeswalker spark ignited. With a thought, she erased Marisol's tainted presence once and for all, Planeswalked to the School of the Unseen, and destroyed the Phyrexian war beast there. Before leaving Dominaria to explore the rest of the multiverse, Jaya Ballard gives Joda an amulet, allowing him to remain sane despite his age, and allowing him to live as long as he wanted to. In the year 2956 AR, we see the rise of the Chiromancer Hydar. With his Rhymewind magic, which was magic that was based on the worship of Eternal Ice, Hydar would go on to attempt another Dominarian Ice Age. He revived Phyrexian War Beast to aid him in his cause, while also recruiting the Crow Vampire Queen Garza Zol as well. He then started a war with the New Argivians, and winning for most of the time, however, he was slowly being influenced by Phyrexian magic, and would begin to kill both his enemies and his allies. This caused Garza Zol to send assassins and kill off Hydar, ending the attempt of a new Dominarian Ice Age. Sometime between this event and the year 3000 AR, trying to exact his revenge on the people that betrayed him, Ravidel begins to plan his move on Karandor. He would battle the Red Man of Planeswalker, Ashwood, and Beric over the newly surfaced Golgothian Silex, but an unknown bargain would be struck to where Ravidel ended up with the Silex altogether. By the time the year 3000 AR arrives, you had the gathering of the Sages of Minarad, which was started by Ashwood and Beric after his encounter with Ravidel. Minarad was an independent city-state in the northern portion of Karandor that served as a place of refuge for the Ice Age and was a major center of learning. The Sages of Minarad included Christine of the Woods, Ashwood and Beric, Grenfell Moore of Gulthanor, Altair of Kalanai, and Lyanna of Minaret. Revadel then arrives in the presence of the Sages and threatens the group with the Golgothian Silas to destroy the world unless his demands were met. Christine of the Woods and the rest of the council members gave in to Ravidel's demands, to leave Minaret to Ravidel and be left alone. Ash Warlord and Beric, however, would leave the council altogether after they refused to fight back against Ravidel. 
Christine of the Woods would end up being banished from the White Woods, Grenfell would be locked away in the Sand Seas of Galthanor, Altair would end up wandering the rest of Corondor for many years, with Lyanna being possessed by Ravidel's spell squire, the Scarlet Vizier. However, the Scarlet Vizier found a way into House Carthline, hoping that a child with a Planeswalker spark will be born into the family to overthrow Ravidel. In the year 3071, the evil mage Johan becomes Emperor of Taras, which was a city on the continent of Jamura. This would be Johan's first step to trying to take over all of Jamura, but the rest of his plan wouldn't be attempted for another few centuries. Skipping ahead to 3226 AR, Toshiro Yumazaro arrives on Dominaria from the plain of Kamigawa after his adventures on his home plane. A master fighter on Kamigawa, he helped fight the dangers that overran his plane. Before he arrived on Dominaria, however, he was blinded by a being called the Myojin of Night's Reach. He would begin the Yumazawa lineage on Dominaria soon afterwards and would build Yumazawa Manor soon after. Between the years 3254 and 3255 AR, we see the rest of the novel Planeswalker unravel. Sanja meets a slave named Ratepe, who has a similar lurk to Urza's brother Mishra. Sanja has Ratepe to pose as Mishra in order to possibly help alleviate some of the madness that Urza was suffering from when he was imprisoned by Yalma. However, it is Joda that would eventually come into the picture after finding out that Urza has returned to Dominaria. He talks with Urza and helps him to regain his sanity. Since the break-in of the shard, Phyrexian sleeper agents have been able to infiltrate Dominaria and pose as normal people. Urza realizes this and tries to devise a way to take out the sleeper agents on Dominaria by using mechanical spires that can track them down, but only when the Null Sphere reaches the apex of its movement. Xanta also discovers that Gix is on Dominaria and barely escapes his presence, making Urza want to kill the sleeper agents himself and giving both Xanta and Ratepe some time off. Xanta and Ratepe decide to go to the Caves of Koilos, where they eventually discover the nature of the Phyrexians and how they were, at one point, Thran citizens, but decide not to tell Urza until his mission against the sleeper agents is finished. On the night of the Null Sphere's apex, the mechanical spiders are activated which kills the sleeper agents, but causes Gix to come out and fight Urza. Urza was losing the fight with Gix, but Ratepe and Xanta interfere as Gix was trying to pry Urza's Power Stone eyes out. The intervention resulted in Xanta and Ratepe sacrificing themselves in a massive explosion so that Urza would defeat Gix in the conflict. Thirty years after the fighting with Gix, Urza and the Wizard Baron would establish the Tolarian Academy in order to prepare for the eventual Phyrexian invasion. In 3307 AR, we see the events of the first half of the book Time Streams being played out. Karn the Silver Golem is created to help Urza go back in time to stop the Phyrexians from destroying the Thran in the past, but before that could be accomplished though, the Phyrexians invade the academy. This was done when one of the students, Joira, finds a man named Carrick, who was shipwrecked earlier in the story and hides him. Carrick, being a Phyrexian sleeper agent, calls the negators to attack the school. Urza would then find Karn and send him back 24 hours to thwart the plant, but with many different problems occurring, the time machine exploded, which leveled the Tolarian Academy. Urza saves a few of the students and faculty using his Planeswalker abilities, while Karn was also to save some of the others as well, though by other means. While this occurred, Carrick and other Phyrexians were locked in that fast time bubble, which helped him construct a fortress and build a small army, but could not create any more Phyrexians due to the lack of metal resources. Ten years later, Urza, Baron, and Karn returned to Tolair, which at this point is littered with small, but fatal slow and fast time rifts. It was discovered that Joya was the last remaining survivor, but it is also found out that another student, Teferi, is locked away in a very slow time bubble. The group then decides to attack Carrick in the fast time bubble. Urza and Joya would survive the first attack, but Joya would fall into a coma that would last for years. When she wakes up, she has an idea of creating a machine that will transport water out of the different time streams in order to make passage between time rifts completely safe. They would go on to rescue Teferi from the time rift he was trapped in, Urza would launch a second attack on Carrick and would get captured in the process, and Karn would rescue Urza from Carrick, only to realize that Urza has given Carrick more resource to work with since he used Metal Warhawks for his invasion. The group realized that a full-scale war is needed, but for every one year that Urza and company prepare for the conflict, Carrick would have 10 years to plan. In the year 3334 AR, we see most of the entire Legends book cycle come to play. The evil mage Johan attempts to conquer the Jamuran city-states of Bryce and Palmyra, however his plan is stopped by Hazazan Tamar, Jaeger Ojanin, Adira Strongheart, and the Rebaran mercenaries. During this conflict though, Jaeger Ojanin gets eaten by a sandworm while trying to hunt down and fight Johan. Later in the second book of the Legend Cycle, Johan reaches the area of Afrava to find Jaeger's son Jeddit. He finds him after a sandworm attempts to kill him during his travel, but Jeddit interferes and kills the sandworm, saving Johan in the process. Johan would later lie to Jeddit about his previous encounter with his father in order to kill off Hazazan Tamar and Adira Strongheart, but during the fighting between the characters, it is revealed that Jeddit's father was actually part of Hazazan and Adira's side. This influences Jeddit to go hunt down Johan, who makes his way to Shaku Castle. Johan would then be imprisoned by the powerful vampire Shaku, who also had a powerful cosmic horror in Solitude as well. When Jeddit's group finally arrives in the area, they befriend the local pine folk and set out to take on Shaku Castle. 
During the fighting, Adira inadvertently frees Johan, who finds out that the cosmic horror that was also freed during the fighting was summoning a fallen star to destroy the castle. Jetta eventually incapacitates Shaku, which they leave her in the building when the fallen star arrives soon after to destroy the entire castle itself. In the third book of the legend cycle, Johan returns to his land and it is found out that he has been building airships to conquer Efrava, Bryce, and the southern portion of Jamura. After stealing a ship and arriving in the newly discovered Scarwood, which are occupied by elves, it is known that they are in the hidden city of Jeddit's ancestry and discover the origin of his people. Soon after, the Ur Drago, who fought the first Ojanin centuries earlier, attacks Jeddit but is defeated in the fighting. The Battle of Efrava soon commences, and during this battle, Johan would end up killing Adira on his flagship, which makes Jeddit attack Johan out of rage. This would lead to Johan's ship crashing to the ground and the two fighting it out, only for Johan to become consumed by a sandworm, the same way Jeddit's father was killed in the first Legends book. The third book of the Legends cycle ends with the funeral of Adira, Hazazan returning to his governorship in Bryce, and Jeddit becoming the leader of the Rebaran mercenaries, with the tiger tribes of Jamura eventually growing and becoming a bigger power on Dominaria. Between the years 3346 and 3359 AR, we return to the Urza plot where Urza journeys to the land of Shiv to find the inactive mana rig. Urza also begins to create the legacy artifacts, starts the Bloodline project in order to create perfect soldiers, while Baron is in charge of protecting the Talarian Academy. After designing plans to build a ship that can planeswalk and attack Phyrexians, Urza travels to the land of Yali Mai in order to get a special type of wood needed for his ship. He would end up being imprisoned and tortured by the characters Multani to exact revenge on what Urza did to the land of Argoth in the Brothers' War thousands of years ago. While in prison, Carrick attacks the Academy, which influences Urza to fight out of his prison, Planes walks to Shiv to gather some of his Metathran bloodline soldiers and fight the Phyrexians at the Academy. During the fighting, Carrick would be defeated and killed. Then, Multani, seeing that Urza means to protect all life against the Phyrexians, gives Urza the Weatherlight Seed in order to make his planned skyship. Also around the same time, Nicol Bolas usurps the land of Madara, becoming its ruler in the process. In the year 3360 AR, Urza focuses his attention on Sarah's realm now that most of Dominaria is building up and the skyship Weatherlight is being built. He does this knowing that the Phyrexians have invaded the plane since his last visit when Danta was still alive centuries earlier. Sarah's realm is controlled of the Angel Radiant at this point and reprimands Urza, but shows Urza what they are doing to combat the Phyrexians. However, Radiant strategies have also been used to kill off innocents who Urza knows are not Phyrexians. Urza is declared a Phyrexian by Radiant, but using his planeswalking abilities, escapes and begins to rescue the inhabitants of Sarah's realm. The Weatherlight is soon finished with Jory becoming the captain and Karn becoming the master of vengeance. The mission from there on is to rescue the rest of the Sarans while also trying to collapse the plane itself with the Phyrexians on it. This would be done by overloading the plane with more white mana energy and tricking Radiant's partner Gorig, who is secretly a mana battery, to impale itself on the Weatherlight in order to help charge the Power Stone Matrix. Meanwhile, Urza and Radiant fight in one-on-one -on -one combat, rips Urza's Power Stone eyes out from him, and tries to combine the Power Stones soon afterwards at her palace. This attempt of combining the Power Stones causes an explosion that destroys Radiant and reconstitutes Urza himself. Sarah's realm then collapses, and the Weatherlight leaves with the energy of Sarah's realm, which is now inside of the ship's power matrix. Months after this, the Saren refugees are fully settled on Dominaria, and Joya and Teferi move to Jalfur in order to end the civil war that was occurring there. Baron and Urza reflect on the past events, but still prep for Phyrexian attacks. Between 3385 and 3571 AR, we see the story of the novel Bloodlines occur at this point. Urza finally reveals the Bloodline project to the Tolarian Academy, and most of the college decides to work on the project. This project divided some of the people within the academy, but Gaitha, a member of the college, abandoned the Bloodlines project altogether in order to start similar experiments on the land of Keld. When he does this, he helps turn the Keldon warriors into nightmarish creatures and helps give rise to the Keldon witch kings. Around this block of time, Karwin also have his memory capped at 20 years, and we see the arrival of Rafelos in the area of Yavimaya to help shape the land's defense against the Phyrexians. Around 3600 AR, in the area of Madara, we see the islands of Argenti and Kusho defect from Nicol Bolas's Madaran Empire. Slightly before this, Nicol Bolas has ruled through three separate entities as its political system before one of the entities, the imperial assassin known as Ramses Overdark, takes over and becomes favored by Bolas. Ramses Overdark attempts to retake Argenti and Kusho, but is thwarted by the warrior champion Tetsuo Yumazawa. Another attack on the island occurs later on. This time, it is led by the half-elven warrior Marhal Elsdragon, who is also favored by Bolas, which results in the defeat of the rebelling islands. However, Marholt Elves Dragon would be killed off by an assassin of Ramsey Overdark, which causes Ramsey Overdark to gain more power. Later on, Tetsuo Yumazawa would hunt down Ramsey's Overdark, defeating him in one-on-one -on -one combat before taking on Bolas, whom he would also kill, or so it is thought. Between the year 3655 and 3863 AR, Urza is able to get the Capuchin clan of the land of Benalia involved with the Bloodline project. 
later on the Phyrexians begin to attack sites of the Bloodline project, which at this point include Benalia, Keld, and even Yavimaya. Near the end of the year 3863 AR, Keld would be attacked by the Phyrexians. Kerwag, the person Yalmoth sent to kill Urza years earlier, leads the attack but gets severely wounded. While Keldans were losing the fight to the Phyrexians for a large portion of the battle, Gaetha would commit suicide by jumping off a cliff in an attempt to not give up vital bloodline information to the Phyrexians. The Keldans did eventually win the battle against the Phyrexians, but due to the Keldan leaders being deceased, there would be a power struggle in Keld soon afterwards. Kurag would later on become the Overseer of Wrath during the Weatherlight Saga. In the year 3964 AR, in the land of Karandor, Adam Carthalion goes on his quest to stop a new disaster that would befall Dominaria as told by Ravidel. On this quest, he does multiple tasks and even goes as far as to sacrifice his own life. However, when Ravidel asks Adam Carthalion to sacrifice his son Jared Carthalion to gain his Planeswalker spark, he refuses to do so. This fight would be known as the Battle of Astra Fall, which killed Adam Carthalion. Before his death though, Adam Carthalion's spell squire takes Jared Carthalion away from the battle to be spared. Sixteen years later, in the year 3980 AR, Jared Carthalion battles Ravidel at his castle, leaves him for dead, and would soon after be apprenticed by Christine of the Woods. However, it would be soon found out that Ravidel was still alive and would try to attack Lyanna of Minarad in order to take the Moxen. Ravidel would fail at this first attempt, which then results in Lyanna giving the Moxen to Jared Carthalion before she is killed. Jared and Christine would then meet up with another Minarad sage, Grenfell Moore, who had been working on a spell to deactivate the Golgothian Silex. Jared and Christine would then become lovers and would later on fight Ravidel again. During that conflict, the Golgothian Silex would be destroyed, but Ravidel would end up stealing the Moxen in order to create the Mox Beacon. This was a device that would summon the planeswalkers that once betrayed Ravidel to Karandor in an attempt to take away their powers. Between 4013 and 4195 AR, Rafaelos fights the Phyrexians in Yavimaya, while the Plane of Wrath is slowly becoming overlapped with the land. In 4150 AR, Teferi's island phases out of existence, which influences Jamuran characters Mangara, Jolriel, and Karabek to unravel the secrets of the area. Mangara would then become one of the most powerful leaders in Jalfur and even in Jamura, thus starting the golden age known as Mangara's Harmony. Mangara's Harmony would later come to an end when the character Karavek imprisons Mangara, which starts the Mirage Wars. This point in time was illustrated in the magic sets Mirage and Visions. Alongside that, Phyrexia would invade Benalia, which would result in Karn rescuing the baby Gerard Capuchin and bringing him to the Jermuran war clan leader, Sadar Kondo. A few years after that, specifically in the year 4188 AR, feature Weatherlight crew member Sisse becomes a cabin boy of a pirate ship after being freed from slavers. Between 4195 and 4205 AR, Ravidel's Mox Beacon would become activated. A massive war broke out on Karandor dubbed the Planeswalkers War, where multiple Planeswalkers that Ravidel encountered throughout the years fought against each other. This included the likes of Gaedra and Diada, Leshrac, Tefish Sot, among many others. Overall, it is unknown as to how the Planeswalkers War played out, but during the war, Jared Carthalion would ascend to become a Planeswalker, with his whereabouts still unknown, and the land of Karandor being devastated during the conflict. A few other Planeswalkers would still play roles in other stories later on, including Leshrac, Christine of the Woods, and Tepich Sot. Alongside this, the Mirage Wars would come to an end in the year 4196 AR. Teferi would begin to repair the time rifts present in the area, and Sisse would meet another future Weatherlight crew member that same year. The rest of this time range includes view of the Kondo clan failing his route of passage, stealing the legacy from Gerard, going to war with his own father and killing him in the process, and being approached by Phyrexia to become the new Evan Car of Wrath, which he would change his name to Volrath soon afterwards. In 4204 AR, Volrath kidnaps Sisse, which influences Gerard, Urtai, Miri, Stark, and Krovax to go to Wrath. Meanwhile, the warrior nation of Kaled begins to invade Jamura in what would become known as the Prophecy War. On Wrath, the story of the Weatherlight crew is in full throttle. The original members of the Weatherlight crew include Gerard Capuchin, Captain Sisse, Hannah's ship navigator, Tangrath, Orum, Urtai, Krovax, Karn Civil Golem, Miri, Stark, Squee, and the Morrow Sorcerer Multani. The crew frees Sisse from Volras' imprisonment. Krovax gets vampirism placed on him, killing Miri soon afterwards. Urtai and Krovax become stranded on Wrath, with the Weatherlight crew escaping Wrath from Mercadia. A year later, in 4205 AR, this would arguably be the most important and action-packed year of Dominaria's history. Volrath would be killed off, Urtai would be corrupted by the Phyrexians, and Krovax would become the new Evancar of Wrath. During the Prophecy War, Jamura would end up winning overall, but Baron's wife Rain would be killed during the war. Soon afterward, however, the Phyrexian invasion of Dominaria begins. Realizing this, Urza recruits the Nine Titans to help with the defense of the plane. The Nine Titans were Bolivar, Daria, Freilis, Lord Wingrace, Tevisat, Commander Griff, Christine in the Woods, and Taser, along with Urza himself. This entire story would be played out in the three novels called Invasion, Plane Shift, and Apocalypse. 
While Urza and the Titans had early victories in the Phyrexian invasion, they soon start to lose momentum when the Phyrexians start to bring reinforcements. Many places become desolate during the invasion as a result, which also includes the suicide of Baron using the Boyer of Doom to destroy the island of Tularia after his daughter Hannah is killed off by Phyrexian Plague. Later on in the invasion, Tevishat would end up betraying the Titans, killing Daria and Christine of the Woods, and influencing Darigaz to reinstate the Prime Evils. Shortly afterwards, however, Karn talks to Darigaz into not joining the fight, resulting in Darigaz committing suicide by diving into a volcano and breaking the tie with the Prime Evils. The other dragons Rith and Croesus would be imprisoned, while Dromar and Treva would be utterly destroyed. Moving on in this year, the skyship Weatherlight would be destroyed, Urza would find Tevishat and kill him, and Gerard and Weatherlight goblin Squee would be captured by Urtai the Corrupted. Shortly afterwards, Urza would join the side of the Phyrexians and kill off the Planeswalker Taser, while Gerard Capuchin would also join Phyrexia. Gerard and Urza would then battle, with Gerard decapitating Urza in the Phyrexian arena. Gerard would then turn on the Phyrexians and find a way to get transported to the Wrath Stronghold. Gerard would then kill Krovax, with Squee killing Urtai around the same time. With the remaining Titans that are left, they activate the Soul Bombs, which was armed earlier by Urza before joining the side of the Phyrexians. This would leave the plane of Phyrexia almost completely destroyed. Karn's memory cap would be removed, which would help him read the Thran Tome in order to help combine the power of the legacy artifacts and revive the skyship Weatherlight. Yamoth, who at this point is over 9,000 years old, enters Dominaria as a death cub, killing up other major characters and many of Dominaria's inhabitants. Yamoth's rampage, however, would be short-lived as the legacy weapon is completed and kills the once great villain of the multiverse. With his combined power and the death of the Yamal, Karn would get his Planeswalker Spark ignited, thus officially ending the Phyrexian invasion. One year after the Phyrexian invasion, the Planeswalker Freilies would erect the Martyr's Tomb to remember the sacrifices made during the War of the Phyrexians. Alongside that, Tangarth, Sisse, and Squee get a new ship and set out on new adventures. In the year 4305 AR, 100 years after the Phyrexian invasion, we see the events of both the Odyssey block and Onslaught block being played out in the land of Otaria. In this area, we see multiple factions already having a foothold, including the black mana base Cabal, the white mana base faction called the Order, and the blue mana base culture of the Mer Empire. There were also the dwarves and barbarians of the Partic Mountains, along with the savage beasts of the Crows and Forest that occupied the area as well. The Cabal, in a bid to gain more power in the region, have been holding gladiatorial style fights while also doing other sorts of underground activity to gain influence. The Cabal at this time is run by the Patriarch, Varat Maglin, who at this point has been the leader for over 200 years. From this year and through the year 4306 AR, we see the story of the Marari, Kamal, and the god Corona unraveling. However, we will come back to these events in the Otaria episode, as this one year alone encompasses the plot of six total books. In 4500 AR, the combination of the Bolas and Leviathan battle on Madara, the Silex Blast from the Brothers' War, the Shard of the Twelve Worlds, the Tolarian Time Experiments, the Rathi Overlay, and the events from Corona and the Onslaught Block, Dominaria's mana is being drained away from multiple time rifts. Time, reality, and magic itself become increasingly unstable, and it becomes a more difficult task to planeswalk to Dominaria. These events were more or less depicted in the Time Spiral block, which shows the overall story of what Dominaria was going through. Multiple planeswalkers would take action in order to save Dominaria from the Time Rifts. For instance, Teferi would give up his spark in order to close the Time Rift over Shiv. Freilies would sacrifice herself closing the Sky Shroud Rift. Lord Windgrace would die closing the Time Rift over Urborg, with Karn closing the Tolarian Time Rifts. Alongside that, you had the resurrection of Nicol Bolas, with Bolas pursuing another task in Kamigawa. Jessica, who is a main character in the Odyssey and Onslaught block novels, falls under the influence of Leshrac. Leshrac would use Jessica's dark powers to seal the time rifts at Yavimai and Jalfur, but would end up damaging Yavimai's ecosystem and destroying Jalfur in the process. She would then try to close the time rift at Madara, but Leshrac would consume her dark powers entirely in order to fight Nicol Bolas in an effort to absorb his power and become the most powerful being in the multiverse. The battle between Nicol Bolas and Lashrak would ensue, and while Lashrak did have the upper hand for most of the fight, Nicol Bolas would come out on top using the Mask of Night's Reach from Kamigawa. He then used Lashrak to completely seal the time rift over Madara, with Lashrak being killed once and for all. Jessica, being free from Lashrak, would go to Otaria and sacrifice herself to seal the time rift there. Soon after this event, the Great Mending takes place, which heals the land of Dominaria. Mana flows back into the plane, restoring life to the world. However, the power of Planeswalkers also changed. From here on, Planeswalkers would lose their immortality and most of their magical powers, and on top of that, the means of traveling between planes without a Planeswalker spark ceases to function. After these events, Teferi would become a mage on Jamura, Jorah would go on to meet a man who claims to be the Archmage Joda, and Nicol Bolas would travel to other planes of the multiverse for the next 60 years in an attempt to become the most powerful being. 
In the year 4560 AR, a ragtag group of planeswalkers called the Gatewatch arrive on Dominaria after a series of adventures and fighting throughout the multiple planes. Dominaria is dealing with the powerful evil of the demon lord Belzenlock after he was summoned from the Abyss. This particular year of the timeline is depicted in the magic set Dominaria, which was released in 2018. Belzenlock has rewritten Dominarian history, making himself more distinguished than what he really was. For instance, he claims to be the Lord of the Waste, creator of the Black Blade, and slayer of Elder Dragons, which we know previously that Yalmoth was the Lord of the Waste, and Dacon being creator of the Black Blade, who also destroyed the Elder Dragon Pyrrha with the weapon. He has also given himself the titles of Evancar of Wrath, the King of Urborg, the Doom of Fools, Master of the Evan Hand, the Scion of Darkness, and the Eternal Patriarch of the Cabal, all of which were titles of other characters in the earlier parts of the timeline. The Gatewatch decide to take out Belzenlock in an effort to rid Dominaria of this new evil. They are joined by Planeswalkers Jaya Ballard, Karn, and even Teferi, who would get his Planeswalker spark back via Jaya through an artifact that she had on hand. The group would also be accompanied by the new crew of the resurrected skyship Weatherlight, with Joyra as their new captain, along with other members being Tiana from the Church of Sarah, Shauna Sisse and Rathwin Capuchin, who are descendants of the original Weatherlight crew, along with the vampire Arvad and the sentient fungus Slimefoot. The group would learn about the existence of the legendary Black Blade, which at this point had been reforged by unknown means, find the legendary sword, and storm the Cabal stronghold. In the ensuing fight with Belzenlock, the group managed to use the legendary Black Blade to slay Belzenlock, freeing Dominaria of another evil once and for all. Knowing now that this powerful weapon has killed both an Elder Dragon and an Elder Demon, the Gatewatch would keep the sword in order to use it against Nicol Bolas, who at this point has become a major threat to the entire multiverse. Soon afterward, however, Nicol Bolas would appear and take control of Gatewatch member Liliana Bess and take her back to Ravnica. The Gatewatch would then planeswalk to Ravnica in an attempt to destroy Nicol Bolas for good. This would lead to the events of War of the Spark shortly afterwards and would be depicted in the magic set of the same name. And that is the end of the Dominarian timeline so far everyone. I hope you enjoyed this video going over the events of the plane itself. In the next video of this series, we take a closer look at the area of the famous continent of Tarissier and what happened there in greater detail. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the Carbazar channel for more Magic the Gathering content. Make sure to also check out my other large projects, which include the top 100 best performing cards of all time, the Thran unofficial audiobook, which goes over the rise of Yawmoth, and the other Magic the Gathering timeline video that includes events of other planes as well. This is Coach signing off, and I will see you all in the next video.